We continue in this exciting study of Bible prophecy and the chronology of end time events. Bible prophecy and the chronology of end time events. And we've divided that Bible study into two parts. In the first teaching, we focused upon the calendar of events that are going to unfold sequentially as the events in heaven. And now today in part two, we'll turn our focus to the sequence of prophetic events in the end times here on the earth. And we're going to read our text for this Bible study, which is John chapter 14, and beginning to read at verse 23, we'll read down through verse 29. Jesus replied, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. I am telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you. I am going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really loved me, you would be happy that I am going to the Father who is greater than I am. I have told you these things before they happen, so that when they do happen, you will believe. As always, let's take a moment to pray. Father, once again, as we open up the Holy Bible, uh, we humble our hearts before you and before all who will be listening to these teachings on how the order of final Bible prophecy is going to play out. I pray that by the anointing of the Spirit, you'll guide us into truth and let the grace of God and the power of Jesus Christ and your glorious presence be felt as we open the scriptures together. I thank you for those who are hungry for more of God. I thank you for those whom the Bible spoke of as Bereans, people who were dedicated daily to the diligent and careful examination of Scripture. Thank you for all of these precious people that you have given the spirit of the Berean church. I pray that you'll guide us and help us I pray that people will increase in wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And above all, I pray that none who listen will be left behind when the rapture takes place. I pray that not one single person will live without Christ. And I pray that as I speak today, when we're done and we offer the invitation to turn from sin and to turn to Christ, that you'll give people the courage to do what they ought to do today. Paul the Apostle said, Behold, today is the accepted time. Behold, today is the time for salvation. I pray that it may be so, and we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory, for we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've been talking about in this text that I read to you out of verse 29, if you'll turn to it once again, Jesus said, I have told you these things before they happen, so that when they do happen, you will believe. Jesus was telling us, as I mentioned in the beginning of part one of this study on Bible prophecy and the chronology of end time events, that when you have the ability to speak about things before they ever take place, as Jesus did, and Jesus took no claim. He said, the words that I'm speaking are not my own words, 
but these are words from the Father, the eternal source of knowledge and wisdom. And the Bible tells us that prophecy provides a proof or a substantial evidence, as Jesus said, that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God. And Jesus said, so that you'll believe in Him. Bible prophecy is about Jesus Christ. And even in the book of Revelation, the Scripture tells us that the very essence of Bible prophecy is Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to challenge you, and first of all, I want to tell you how proud I am of you, because this is a subject matter that a lot of people would probably pass on by. But anyone who's listening to this teaching, it proves to me that you have a unique hunger to learn the Bible, because these things are not easy things. There's much debate, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But the purpose of this study is to provide a resource. And these will be available on our YouTube channel. These teachings, part one and two, will be available on our Facebook archives. Uh, if you don't follow us on Facebook, by the way, uh, you need to follow the Facebook ministry page, which is Tiff Shuttlesworth Dash Lost Lamb Association. Uh, they max out friend pages at 5,000 and so, uh, many, many years ago, we had to create a ministry page that provides unlimited followers. But all of the videos are archived even on Facebook. And then we also have a podcast channel, and they are being edited and added to the podcast channel on a systematic basis as well. But the purpose is to provide you with a fundamental understanding as to the chronology of final Bible events because understanding the chronology of Bible prophecy is a tremendous help in being able to build your understanding of the totality of the Bible. As you've heard me say multiple times, almost 30% of your Bible, the content is Bible prophecy. And if God who gave us the scriptures through holy men of old who penned those scriptures under the distinct inspiration of the Holy Spirit without error, if God included over 30% of the Bible as prophetic content, then you cannot be a serious student of the Bible without being a serious student of Bible prophecy. Uh, I also need to address something as we begin because of the nature of this Bible study. I have always been honest enough to tell you up front that there are people who have varying views on end time prophecy. And uh, there will be some who would disagree. And sooner or later, if you discuss Bible prophecy or you study Bible prophecy, you'll run into some of those who have differing views and some are quite dogmatic about it. And I always want to be honest enough to tell you that there are opposing views. And though I may strongly disagree with opposing views, uh, as a Christian it is my responsibility not to be disrespectful or to be uh, mean-spirited, but to just be honest enough to tell you there are people who have differing views. But that is why I take the time. These are not brief uh, Bible studies that are uh, in our attempt to cram it into a handful of moments. No, we approach the Bible in an academic way. I treat you as if you were a student in a Bible college or a seminary because I want you to have that depth of, of understanding as, as we'll do today. But I say that because you cannot be on social media. As many of you know, just in the last two weeks, we've had now approaching over a million and a half views just on two videos. Well, you can imagine with the amount of views that we had during COVID, uh, probably 1.2, 3, 4 million. I don't uh, keep a specific count. But you can imagine with that incredible number of views, the incredible number of critics uh, who write in comment sections and uh, contact the ministry. And, and quite frankly, not all are, are friendly. If you haven't figured out by now, social media is rife 
with arrogant Christians uh, who have had, quite frankly, no formal theological education. And I want to pause long enough to say something. I hate academic snobbery. That's what I call it. I absolutely despise academic snobbery. But I absolutely love proper academics. But there are a lot of people on the internet who have had absolutely zero formal theological training, but these, uh, I call them smug neophytes, but they are. They're, they're arrogant and they're accusatory and uh, they're quick to call people false teachers and to make judgmental accusations. And I hope that you won't get caught in the um, muddy waters of the side comments that oftentimes uh, follow social media teaching. Listen very carefully, and what I'm about to say I consider to be golden Christian wisdom. So pay attention. An intelligent and studious Christian has the right to disagree on certain views, but if they're Christ-like and if they're godly, they'll do so with humility and grace and not with accusations and verbal assaults. That is so important and I hope all of our students will adopt that as your personal Christ-like goal. So let me say it again because it carries a lot of weight, especially in the days of growing social media. An intelligent, studious Christian has the right to disagree on certain views that may be less than clear in the scriptures. But if you're Christ-like and if you're godly and if you're humble, you will not do it with accusations and verbal assaults. You'll always handle it with grace and humility. And many of these, and I, I do my best to read as much as I can and respond, and so uh, unfortunately in my endeavor to read everything, I do come across some of these in <clears throat> incredibly arrogant false accusations. And many of their self-important responses violate, uh, excuse me, violate a code of honor that is taught in the scripture, and their spirit of dispute they'll answer for in eternity's morning because the Bible teaches us that we'll give an account for every idle word. And many of them are violating uh, that biblical code of honor. For example, in the book of Jude, chapter 1 and verse 9, the Bible says, Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. That's a pretty powerful insight. Michael, the archangel, did not bring careless verbal assault and accusation against the fallen devil we know as Satan. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 5, and verse 1, Paul the Apostle told Timothy, never rebuke an elder. Never rebuke an elder. But because people uh, ask, and uh, I wrestled whether to say this or not, but because of the growing number of followers and people who are asking, you know, who are you, where are you from, uh, what is your educational background, uh, I want to just give you a thumbnail on that. And the reason why I hesitated to do this is because I certainly would never uh, want to come across as boastful. But because there are so many hundreds and thousands of new listeners, uh, for those of you who have found us recently, I graduated from North Point Bible College and Graduate School, which it is now called, uh, with my wife Judy of 43 years. And I am currently... Uh, completing my master's degree in theology at this late stage of life. Uh, I decided with my recent uh, escalating involvement with the school 
I was going to put some of my study time into a place of, of getting a degree for it for the purposes of teaching, but North Point Bible College and Graduate School is a fully accredited institution that is almost 100 years old, uh, just outside of, of Boston, Massachusetts. And I currently serve as chairman of the Board of Trustees there at North Point Bible College and Graduate School. Listen to what I'm about to say. If I were teaching heresy or false doctrine or things that could not be supported with the scriptures, do you think with all of the faculty at the Bible College and all of my academic friends and all of those friends who have doctorate degrees, do you think if I were involved in spurious teaching and in false teaching that I wouldn't hear from them? I promise you, I have a network of friends with doctorate degrees that if I were waiting off the reservation, I would most certainly hear from them and I would be happy to address that. But I've studied the Bible for more than 50 years and have been in full-time ministry for over 40 years. And I'm not saying any of this to boast, but just to help the hundreds and thousands who are just recently finding us through some of these viral videos. And I just want to say this. I carry a heavy weight of responsibility to study the Bible, to carefully examine the text, and to bring to you what the Bible teaches. If the Bible says it, I'll teach it to you. If the Bible doesn't teach it, then I'll not waste your time trying to give you my opinions. Now, with that said, let me take you one step deeper into that understanding of, of criticism that you'll hear as pertains to the chronology of final Bible prophecy. Any of the voices that criticize the order of events that I'm teaching to you, which fall under a category of pre-millennial view, and I'll address that in just a moment and bring some clarity to all of the new students who are asking so many questions on that, but you're going to find that the majority, the vast majority of people who will attack this ministry and attack our views on Bible prophecy, they're not premillennial in their view. They are either amillennial, and I'll define it in a moment, they're either amillennial in their view, or they are postmillennial in their view. Because it doesn't take me but a matter of moments when I read their comments and try to answer their questions uh, because of my decades of studying Bible prophecy, uh, within a matter of moments, by their own words, I can immediately tell that they're either amillennial in their view or they're postmillennial in their view. And by the way, I, I do have, have teaching on that. And they do not accept what is called the classical premillennial view of final Bible prophecy. Now, I hope I'm not in any way trying to get too deep. I, I don't want to lose anyone. I always do my best to try to carefully explain this. But these are things that I believe that any serious student of the Bible, if you don't already understand it, I hope that in following this ministry, you will understand it. Now, when I speak of the premillennial view on Bible prophecy, which is what I strongly teach, strongly believe, listen carefully. It was the only view of the early church. The early church of the first century, the church that was birthed in the upper room in Acts chapter 2, the church and all of the early church fathers universally had a pre-millennial view on end time prophecy events without exception for over 300 years. That is why you oftentimes hear me say I am teaching from a classical pre-millennial view on interpreting Bible prophecy. Why? because it was the only view, uncontested, 
no other view existed for over 300 years. So the early church only had one view, the premillennial view, and that is the view that I'm teaching to you. Now, there's another view that I mentioned to you called amillennial, and uh, ah simply means no, no millennium. Uh, amillennialists do not believe that there will ever be a literal millennium. They do not believe in most of these events as being literal. They believe them to be allegorical, and they believe them to be figurative. And they are often referred to in the world of theology. And sooner or later, if you study Bible prophecy, you'll come across the word amillennial or amillennialist, and now you understand that. And there's teaching on that, by the way. I have entire teachings on what is amillennialism, what is premillennialism, what is postmillennialism, and so on. Those are available to you. Postmillennialism, by the way, let me just touch on that briefly, because some of the critics, I don't know why, and again, I'm going to be gracious, but some critics actually still hold on to what is called the postmillennial view. Now, without teaching on the postmillennial view, in a thumbnail, postmillennialists believe that prophecy is going to unfold until there is a heaven on earth. They believe that from the inception of the church in the first century to the fulfillment of final Bible prophecy, that the earth would move into a state of becoming more and more Christian until everyone in the world was Christian and they believe in what is oftentimes referred to as a heaven on earth view. But after World War II, it became increasingly difficult for any intelligent, educated scholar to preach and teach the view of postmillennialism. Now, you'll find plenty of postmillennialists still on YouTube again. Uh, you can almost be certain that anyone you're listening to who teaches post-millennialism, um, they're waiting in a shallow pool. The post-millennial view is pretty much eradicated from all accepted scholarship in modern times. And let me just ask you a question. Does it look like our world is becoming heaven on earth? Does it look like politics around the world are becoming more and more righteous more and more Christ-like? Does it look like all of the people on the earth, by and large, are Christ followers and love the Bible and build their societies upon the teachings of the scriptures? Or does it look like the world is getting worse and worse? You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be a seminary graduate to understand that anyone who holds to a post-millennial view I can't give you an intelligent reason why, because it has been pretty much dismissed from any position of higher education after World War II. So if you're taking notes, maybe you should write this down. The premillennial view, and I'll go over it a couple of times. The premillennial view was the original and only uncontested view of the New Testament church for over 300 years. Very important. Let me give it to you again. The pre-millennial view, and we're going to explain it, but the pre-millennial view was the original and only uncontested view of the New Testament church for over 300 years. It wasn't until, uh, and again, I don't want to wade into a lot of complications, but it wasn't until the first ecumenical council at Nicaea in 325 AD that a Christian scholar by the name of Origen, who was probably from uh, around Alexandria, Egypt, began to 
talk about what he called an amillennial view. Not until 325 at the first ecumenical council at Nicaea in 325 AD, a man named Origen was the first credited with beginning to talk about the amillennial view. Now, Augustine, and many of you will recognize the name Augustine, but Augustine was strongly influenced by Origen's teachings, and because of Augustine's power and authority, he was the first that notably began to publish and put his seal of approval upon the amillennial view. So from the infancy of the church until 325 AD, there was no other view but what I call the classical pre-millennial view. Now, the amillennialists believe in allegorical interpretation. In other words, they don't believe that prophecy is real. They don't believe that it's literal. They believe that it's all symbolic, it's all figurative, and therefore all of their teaching is skewed around the fact that they don't interpret the scriptures nor Bible prophecy literally. Now, that's as far as I'm going to go because this Bible study is not about uh, talking about amillennialism and postmillennialism, but you cannot talk or teach properly about the chronology of end time events if you're not honest enough to tell your followers and your students and those who follow your ministry that the premillennial view is not uncontested. And so as always, I've always done my best in teaching to let you know that there are other views. And then I oftentimes will teach what those views are and then I do my best to make a biblical case as to why we put the weight of scholarship upon a certain view. And so I want to state it one more time for clarity. This Bible study, this chronology of Bible prophecy and end time events is from the classical pre-millennial view that the early church taught, believed, and wrote about for 325 years. And again, I have several uh, video teachings on that. With that said, let's go right back in to the chronology of events. And as you are listening to this Bible study, I trust that you've already listened to part one in this study, which is entitled Bible Prophecy and the Chronology of End Time Events uh, I felt it might be easier to understand if we divide that into two parts, which many eschatology scholars do. And we divide it into the two parts, and the two parts are the chronology of events in heaven, and that was part one. If you haven't listened to part one, be sure to go back and listen to it. There's much in that first teaching that feathers into part two. And so... Part 1, the chronology of events in heaven. And now we'll turn our focus for the remainder of our time together on the chronology of events in and on this earth. Number 1, the seven-year tribulation period. We obviously have already covered the rapture in the events in heaven. And why do we call the rapture and, and classify that as an event in heaven? Because we are raptured from this earth because it takes place in the twinkling of an eye. And so the process of the rapture in just the twinkling of an eye has a, a brief exposure on earth, but we meet the Lord in the air to be with Him forever. We are taken to heaven. And so it is better categorized as an event in heaven. So we're talking today about the chronology of the events on earth, and we'll begin with the seven-year tribulation period. And to better understand that tribulation period, let me divide it into a few parts for you. If you're taking notes, number one, the beginning of the tribulation period. The beginning of the tribulation period. 
the first three and a half years of the tribulation period will begin on a precise and exact moment. And the beginning and that exact moment takes place when the Antichrist signs a peace treaty in Jerusalem, Israel for a seven-year trial treaty. And that's taught in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. And Daniel, of course, if you're a new student of the Bible, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament is one of the great prophecy books in understanding prophecy. It is a companion piece to the book of Revelation, which is the last book in the New Testament. And they are two companion pieces, Old Testament, New Testament, even though there are multiple books that add to our knowledge of, of Bible prophecy. But Daniel 9 and 27, the Bible tells us, uh, Daniel the prophet prophesied a period of seven years on earth that will be inaugurated by the signing of this peace treaty. And the man who signs it in Jerusalem will be the Antichrist. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel also referenced that in Ezekiel uh, chapter 38, uh, verses 8 and verse 11. Then in the beginning of the tribulation, we know that the Jewish temple, the third temple, will be completed. Now I'm often asked, will the temple uh, be built before the rapture? Or will we see the beginning of the building of the third temple before the rapture? The Bible is not absolutely clear on exactly when the beginning of the third temple and its rebuild occurs. But the Bible is clear that the temple is operating sometime in the first half of the Great Tribulation, in that first three and a half years. And so I personally allow for the possibility, and I'm not dogmatic on it, but it would seem that we may see, prior to the rapture of the church, the beginning of the building of the temple. We already have a lot of the uh, stones cut and pre-cut and things that are pre-built and the Temple Institute is in full function and a red heifer has been born for the ceremony that will be needed to purify the third temple. There hasn't been a red heifer born since the days of Christ in 2018. The first perfect flawless red heifer was born 2018 since the days of Jesus Christ. And they need a perfect red heifer for the sacrifice that will purify the third temple. And so now everything that needs to be in place for the building of the temple is lined up and ready to go. Will we actually see some agreement between the Jewish people and the Arabs on giving up ground for that rebuilding? That's the great war that currently is occurring. But... Again, I allow, you may see, and by the way, if you ever do see the beginning of the construction of the third temple, you had better be living every moment ready to meet the Lord because the rapture will immediately follow. Whether it's days or weeks, I don't know. But if you ever live long enough to see the third temple in Jerusalem and construction begins on a third temple, you had better have all of your accounts with God paid in full and living ready to meet the Lord. Then after the rebuilding of the third temple, uh, we know that there's going to be a revival of what the Bible calls the Roman Empire, which will emerge as a confederacy of ten nations. That will occur in the early stages of the tribulation. We find that in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, verses 40 through 44. We find it in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. And we find it again in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 12. So these are things that will occur in the very beginning of the Great Tribulation. In the first half of the Great Tribulation, the first three and a half years, the seven sealed scroll will be opened. And uh, I've done a teaching on that, and I referred to this in our <clears throat> first teaching, part one. And if memory serves me right, I think I may have 
uh, accidentally said seven sealed scrolls, uh, which is an easy mistake to make. But let me clarify if I did make that mistake. It is one scroll, whether it has multiple pages, the Bible doesn't say, but uh, it is one scroll with seven seals. That seven sealed scroll is open in Revelation chapter 6. We read about that. That is going to happen in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. And the opening of the seven sealed scroll will begin a series of systematic judgments on earth. Also in the first three and a half years of the great tribulation, God is going to raise up 144,000 Jewish evangelists. The scripture tells us 12,000 Jewish evangelists out of each of the 12 tribes. And they will proclaim the gospel during the tribulation. We find that in Revelation and the seventh chapter. But it speaks to us of the grace of God that even during the tribulation, even during the tribulation, God is still going to allow the gospel to be made available to the whosoever will may come. Then in Bible prophecy we read of what the scripture calls Gog and his allies or Magog that invade Israel. And this will be in the, we're talking about the tribulation. Right now we're talking about the first three and a half years. In that first three and a half years will be the Gog and Magog military assault against Israel. But the Bible tells us that it's not going to be much of a war because God is going to supernaturally defend Israel and wipe out entirely Gog and his allied nations. Uh, we read of that in Daniel chapter 11, uh, verses 40 through 45, and we also read about that in Ezekiel chapter 38 and chapter 39. This will probably, and when I say this, this war, this allied group of nations, Gog and allied nations, Magog, attacking Israel, wiped out by God, this will probably take place just prior to the midpoint of the tribulation. And why do I believe that and why do I say that is because I believe that it's only again in the natural interpretation, the natural reading of Bible prophecy that the decimation of these major global forces is what will provide the opportunity for the Antichrist to begin his final escalation into total global authority and his brutal mandates. Because in the first half of the tribulation, uh, the Antichrist is active. He has risen to power immediately after the rapture of the church. He is operating and carrying out uh, the work prophesied in Scripture, but the fulfillment where he comes to the place of being revealed as the wicked one, that first beast in Revelation 13, accompanied by the second beast, which is the false prophet, and the dragon, which is Satan, all three of those, the unholy trinity found in Revelation 13, it's probably this allied war where God supernaturally decimates Gog and Magog that causes a vacuum in that part of the world that allows the Antichrist to escalate to that highest position of authority that the Bible says that he will have. That brings us to the midpoint of the tribulation period. And the midpoint of the tribulation period is marked by the Antichrist breaking his covenant or his peace treaty with Israel that he made in Jerusalem. Remember Daniel 9, 27, the Antichrist is revealed. It's the beginning of the tribulation, the day that he signs the seven-year peace treaty, a Gentile allied with Jews, but he lies 
He's a deceiver. And he breaks that treaty. The breaking of that covenant with Israel is the midpoint of the tribulation period. And it will be marked by him setting up what is called the abomination of desolation in the Holy of Holies in the third temple. It will most likely be a statue of himself. After the battle of Gog and Magog, there's this political, economic vacuum in that part of the world. The Antichrist is promoted to his highest authority during this time. The Bible says he then begins to call himself God and forces people to worship him as God. And he sets up a statue of himself and he desecrates the third temple. That is the midpoint of the tribulation. And the reason why I take a few moments to give some details on that is the last three and a half years that begin to unfold are oftentimes called the Great Tribulation. And is it wrong to call the entire seven years the Great Tribulation? No. Many scholars do. Many authors do. Uh, many highly educated people that focus upon the studies of eschatology through the years have referred to the entire seven years as the Great Tribulation, but it might be more technical and more useful in you understanding that the last three and a half years are much worse. And so therefore, uh, I don't have any problem with referring to the last three and a half years as the Great Tribulation period. But let's be honest, it's all going to be horrific. And over half of the world's population is going to die through a series of judgments and bowls and trumpets and earthquakes and natural disasters and war and probably nuclear war, etc. None of the seven years is going to be an easy time. It's all going to be great tribulation if you want to be that technical. This begins the last three and a half years of the tribulation. What begins? The abomination of desolation. That will begin the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And it is during that last three and a half years that the Antichrist escalates and mandates his political, his military, his economic, and his religious mandates and his economy, the mark of the beast, so on. All of that is going to transpire in the last three and a half years. And we read about that in Revelation chapter 13. The last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation will be the greatest period of apocalyptic events and the outpouring of God's unprecedented wrath that the world will ever see. It is oftentimes called in the Bible the Great Tribulation, uh, even referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. Matter of fact, if you have your Bible, uh, let's open to Jeremiah and the 30th chapter. Jeremiah and the 30th chapter because that's where the term, the time of Jacob's trouble, is actually located. The Old Testament book of Jeremiah, chapter 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. In the New Living Translation, it reads, In all history, there has never been such a time of terror. It will be a time of trouble for my people Israel, yet in the end they will be saved. And then in that last three and a half year period, as the Antichrist rises to power, assumes full control, begins to put his military, his religious, his political, his economic system into uh, ruthless mandates, he'll be assassinated. Somebody in the world doesn't like him. Perhaps a group of nations that he has uh, put under his heel and been vicious with, or been unfair with, or compromised, or lied, or deceived them. We don't know, other than the Bible tells us, 
that the Antichrist is assassinated, but then is miraculously resurrected back to life, which then takes him into a position of uncontested global power. His assassination followed by his visible resurrection. And again, remember, the Antichrist is a counterfeit of Christ. This is the Antichrist counterfeiting the life, death, and burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's great debate among scholars as to whether it's an actual resurrection or all of this is a play of deception because Satan does not have the miracle power, obviously, that Christ has. He's an angel and a fallen angel at that. And so there's great debate as to whether it is a true assassination and a true resurrection or is it all some type of deception politically that's carried out to deceive the people. We don't have time to get into that today, but I do want to make you aware of it. And we read about that in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 45. We also read about that in Revelation chapter 13 uh, verses 3. Uh, verse 12, verse 14, and also in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 8. Now, when this time of persecution escalates, both by the persecution of the Antichrist and the increase of God's judgment and wrath, the Jewish people, the Bible tells us, are going to flee to a place called Petra, and I've been there. And Petra is located in Jordan. And the Jewish people during this time of escalated persecution will flee to Petra. They'll hide there and there they will seek protection and shelter for the remaining time of the Great Tribulation. We read about that in Matthew chapter 24 uh, verses 6 through uh, 16 through 20. Also, Revelation chapter 12, verses 15 through 17. It is during the last three and a half years of the tribulation that the two witnesses sent by God begin their three and a half years of ministry once again, the gospel being preached even during the tribulation period. That's found in Revelation 11, verses 2 and 3. Then the mark of the beast will be introduced and enforced by the false prophet. This takes place probably at the very beginning of the last three and a half year period. That's found in Revelation 13 verses 16 through 18. Now pause for a moment, take a deep breath. I know I'm covering a lot of information. And so I want to pause and remind you once again that this Bible study is a resource and a reference that you can go back to and listen to repeatedly. And I do that myself. I have various teachings from various scholars. Uh, some of them are on audiobook and uh, some of them are available in digital audio form. And I listen to them over and over and over. There have been times when I've uh, been in my vehicle and perhaps traveling by vehicle instead of by plane to a destination and had a trip of four, five, six hours. And I've listened to a single teaching all the way down and all the way back. Uh, repetition is one of the best ways to learn. So please don't feel overwhelmed. I know that this is like drinking out of a fire hydrant, but I'm providing you with something you can return to and listen to hit pause, take better notes, open your Bible, study it. That's what I'm praying. I'm praying that this study is a resource that you'll take your time to revisit and study with Bible in hand until you have a good understanding of all of these fundamentals and chronology. During the last half of the three and a half years of tribulation period, we also know that the trumpet judgments will be poured out upon the earth. <clears throat> That's found in Revelation chapter 8 and in Revelation chapter 9. That brings us to the end of the tribulation period. And the bowl judgments are released in rapid succession 
at the end of the Great Tribulation period. And we read about that in Revelation chapter 16. Again, that last three and a half years of the seven years of tribulation, oftentimes called Jacob's trouble or the Great Tribulation, will be the worst period of terror, horror, bloodshed, disease, natural disaster, unimaginable apocalyptic events the world will ever see. Then the Battle of Armageddon will take place, probably towards the end of the three and a half years. We read about that in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 16. It is probably during this battle of Armageddon that Babylon is destroyed. We know that Babylon is destroyed in the last three and a half years of that tribulation period. That's found in Revelation 18. The two witnesses that God raised up to preach the gospel are killed by the Antichrist and left publicly on display in Jerusalem for three and a half days. And then they are miraculously resurrected by the power of God. We read about that in Revelation chapter 11, verses 7 and verses 12. That brings us to the end of the tribulation period. And uh, I know that I've given you a lot of chronology for the great tribulation. I've done that because that is the most frequently asked question uh, concerning Bible prophecy are the events and the timing of the Great Tribulation. The Tribulation ends with an incredible event, the second coming of Christ. And Christ returns with the church and He descends to the very place that He ascended when He left earth in His public ministry as recorded in the book of Acts. He ascended into heaven. And those that were there and followers and even unbelievers witnessed His ascension into heaven. From the Mount of Olives, He'll return to the exact same geographical place with His saints. Remember, the rapture is Christ coming for the church. The second coming at the end of the tribulation is Christ returning with the church. And those two events are like bookends on the beginning and the ending of the seven years of tribulation. The rapture, after the rapture, begins the tribulation. The tribulation goes on for seven years exactly, ends with the second coming of Jesus Christ. If you'd like, go into your Bible with me to Zechariah. Zechariah. And the fourth, 14th chapter. Zechariah and the 14th chapter. And verse 4. On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will split apart making a valley running from east to west. Half the mountain will move towards the north and half towards the south. We also read about that in Isaiah chapter 34, uh, verses 1 through 6. Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 6. And Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. Now remember, this is the final event of the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation ends with the second coming of Jesus Christ, and it ends abruptly. At the conclusion of this period, the Bible teaches us that Christ returns with power and great glory. And the scripture says that the heavens will be ablaze with His glory as He comes to establish His kingdom on earth. Now in the chronology of final Bible events, that brings us to a period what happens after the tribulation? After the tribulation, there are a series of judgments. The Antichrist and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 19, 20 and 21. Israel is judged, Ezekiel 20, verse 30 through 39. Matthew 25, 
1 through 30. Israel is judged. The Gentiles are judged. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Satan is bound and cast into the abyss for a thousand years. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. The Old Testament saints and the saints that are saved during the tribulation, those who receive Christ and refuse the mark of the beast through either the preaching of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, perhaps through the message of the two prophets sent by God, the two witnesses, or perhaps through the angel that God sends to preach in the tribulation. But there will be people saved. They, the tribulation saints, will be judged together with the Old Testament saints and are resurrected. We read about that in Daniel 12 and 1 through 3, Isaiah 26 and verse 19, and Revelation 20 and verse 4. After this series of judgments begins a thousand year period called the millennium or the millennial reign of Christ. We find this mentioned in Revelation 20 verses 4 through 6. At the end of that 1,000 year period, Satan will finally be judged and will meet his final defeat and cast into the lake of fire forever and forever. We read about that in Revelation chapter 20 verses 7 through 10. Then we have the great white throne judgment and all who are at the great white throne judgment sadly, tragically, will be eternally lost. If you ever appear at the great white throne judgment, there is no hope. You have rebelled against God you have rejected Christ, you have thrown out His commands, His teachings, His righteousness, His holiness, you have chosen to live all of your life by self-will, self-evaluation, uh, self-aspiration, but at the great white throne judgment, those are eternally lost. We read about that in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. After that will be the destruction of the heavens and the earth, which will be followed by a creation of a new heaven and a new earth. Apparently after all of this horrific war, judgments, bloodshed, the Bible says in the battle of Armageddon the, the blood will flow to the horse's bridle. There's debate as to exactly the depth of that or the literalness of that. But you can imagine with four to five billion people dying, the rotten flesh, the blood, the, uh, the wildlife, no doubt has gone into a different area of aggressiveness and on and on and on. God is going to have to destroy this earth and clean it up. And then the Bible says he will create the new heavens and the new earth. We read about that in Isaiah 65 and 17. Isaiah 66 and verse 22, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13, and Revelation chapter 21 and verse 21. After the creation of the new heavens and the new earth, we then have chronologically eternity. We enter into the eternal kingdom. We read about that in Revelation 21 and verse 9 all the way through Revelation 22 and verse 5. Let me just read a couple of verses from that eternal reign entering into eternity. Revelation chapter 21, if you have your Bible. Revelation chapter 21, verses 23 through 27. Listen carefully to what the scripture says. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, 
and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And I want to conclude this study on Bible prophecy and the chronology of end time events. We've given this to you in two parts. Again, this is not exhaustive. There is so much more that needs to be taught and in the days ahead I will. But this gives you at least a fundamental understanding of what is called the classical premillennial view and the chronology of end time events. But that passage that I re read said, nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Can I help some that might feel overwhelmed or intellectually you feel like this is too difficult? First of all, I applaud you for making an effort and pray. Because the Bible says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let them ask of God, who gives to all people liberally and upbraideth not. God will increase your knowledge as you study the Bible. The study of God's Word is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And the more you study the Bible, the more intelligent you become, the wiser you become, the more discerning you become. The stronger your faith becomes. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God as we have done today. So this will conclude our time of studying the events in heaven, the events on earth, and Bible prophecy, and the biblical chronology of end time events. Before we leave, I want to say one thing. Is your name in that Lamb's Book of Life? Would you be ready to meet the Lord? And if not, will you pray with me today? If you're uncertain as to whether you'd be ready to meet the Lord, should He come today, just wherever you're at, will you pray with me right now? Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, I by faith believe all of your promises. I believe that what you said you meant and what you meant you said. Though I may not understand everything about Bible prophecy, this I do understand today. I want to be ready to meet the Lord when He returns. And so today I confess my sin and I'm willing to repent in childlike faith I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus. With the blood he shed on the cross, cleanse me, wash me, make me holy in your eyes. Today I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and I vow I will live for him and I ask you to help me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me your power to be what I ought to be. In Jesus' name, amen.
come into my heart, Lord Jesus.